Ben and Nobody cares. I'm Warren Brown. And I'm Jordan Sandberg. And we're here to talk about cutting edge image processing with normals. So what do we mean by that? Because uh, normal, like I think Abby Normal, Mel Brooks, Young Frankenstein, nobody got that. What is this? <laughs> it's, a conch shell. it's a conch shell, right? It's actually a picture of a conch shell, right? Okay. What can you tell about the conch shell from this picture? It has depth. It has depth, yeah. Uh -huh. Can you, tell, can you tell much about it at all? Can you see the shadows? That's a problem, oh. right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of advances in digital camera technology in the last 10 years. You guys have grown up with that. You're pretty accustomed to it. But digital cameras have really been a revolution in the world of scientific researchers because it's enabled them to have access to this technology to digitize collections all around the world. But in doing so, we found out that maybe it's not as useful as we would like it to be. So if, you're, if you study malacology, which is the study of shells, and you want to know more about this conch shell, but this conch shell's in Europe, and you can't get it. You can get a picture of it, though. Is this picture really going to be useful to you? No. Is that? A little more, yeah. What's the difference between these two images? We have texturization, and we have shading. So how can, how can you see the physical texture of an object that you cannot hold in your hands? And that's the challenge. As we, as we have this push to digitize everything, and we want to be able to electronically transmit something from me to you so that you can have the same quality of inspection and experience without having to hold it in your hands, how do we accomplish that? And so that's what we'd like to talk about today. And this is a really great demonstration because you can see what we can do now, thanks to calculus, and what we couldn't do before we had some calculus. Whose crazy idea was this? This lady I had the honor of meeting. She came to UF and she was a visiting scholar for a grant that we have where I work. Her name is Dr. Corey Toller Franklin and she is at the bleeding forefront cutting edge of this kind of work. Um, she did her undergrad in architecture from Cornell. She uh, did her masters in computer graphics at Cornell as well and she did a PhD in computer science from Princeton. Um, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> That's really, really, really impressive. Um, her work is used in archaeology, computational biology, museum conservation, and she's uh, authored algorithms for data capture, computer-assisted pattern matching, machine learning techniques for reassembling artifacts, and non-photorealistic rendering of science for scientific analysis. What does non-photorealistic renderings mean? That. This is a non-photorealistic rendering. So her professional experience, she, uh, as a graduate student, she worked at an island in Greece, Akrotiri, Thera, but it's known as Centiri Greece, Centiri Greece in the modern parlance. Anybody know what Pompeii was? Okay, so Akrotiri was just like Pompeii, but nobody's ever heard of it. It was a lovely Greek village. There was a volcano that exploded. It covered the village just like Pompeii was covered. The big difference between Akrotiri and Pompeii was that Akrotiri had fantastic fresco murals. They had 40, 50, 60 foot murals that covered much of the city. And when it got covered in, by the volcano, many of those murals were preserved, but they were knocked over. And when they got knocked over, they were shattered into pieces about the size of a jigsaw puzzle. So there are archeologists that have spent 40 years of their professional career studying these pieces of those fresco murals, trying to reassemble them. Dr. Corey Toller Franklin comes along and says, you know, I bet calculus could help with that. So she wrote, algorithms using calculus so that you could scan each one of those and have the machine suggest the patterns that match and reassemble the frescoes. So in two years, they reassembled as many frescoes as they did in the last 40 years. And that's the power of calculus, when you know what you're doing like she does. She also worked um, between degrees after her master's and before her PhD. She worked as a programmer for Autodesk. Anybody know who Autodesk is? I know Adam does. Okay, for those of you that don't know, that's the software that architects use. I guarantee you that this building was designed using Autodesk software. It's huge. It's, it's much larger than Microsoft. It's much larger than Apple. But it's commercial, so most people haven't heard of it. Um, she right now is a uni the Cal University of California President's Postdoctoral Fellow in the Computer Science Department at UC Davis, and she collaborates with Yale. She's also a researcher at the Citrus, not Oranges, <laughs> Citrus Bonato Institute at UC Berkeley. Um, she's, she's really, really amazing. So what's the challenge that she set out to conquer? Okay, so um, we actually thought of a bunch of different ideas, or a, def a bunch of different challenges, and Corey Toller, I always want to call her Tori Kohler, mm -hmm. but Corey Toller's thought of 
or has a solution for all these and more. So just to just to show you some of the challenges, how can you see text the texture of an object that you can't physically hold in your hands? How can you make a digital copy of a physical object? How can you travel through time and recover lost information? How do you digitally preserve an object for the future? And how do you discover new knowledge about things that people haven't seen before? And how do you extrapolate the surface of a two-dimensional of a two-dimensional picture? And that's basically if you don't, how can you find the surface of something that you can't numerically integrate if it doesn't have a function? Right. If we don't know the function of something, do we do we know what the function of this is? Do we know how to draw this shape? No, we don't. So so how do we how do we then, in order to tell it what to tell the computer to describe it, we have to be able to model it. So how do we figure out what the function is, or how do we? And it's kind of like remember when we did Newton's method, and we 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 had to estimate stuff, and we had to numerically integrate. It's the same thing, but applied to physical objects. How do we get them in the computer? Because we don't know the function for the chair you're sitting in. We don't know the function for the shoes that I'm wearing. So we have to figure out some way of capturing that and extrapolating it from the physical things we can measure. This is a problem that scientists have um, tried to conquer before. And ever, anybody heard of the digital Michelangelo? A few years ago, this uh, really clever guy came up with this idea. And he said, hey, what if we use lasers? and we can map the surface of something with a laser. And check this out. And uh, this got a lot of funding, and it, it, it took a really long time to do. And they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars doing this. So at the time, in the early 90s, this was state-of-the-art stuff. You can see the size and scale of this equipment. They built a scaffold, which would robotic, robotically move up and down a laser scanning head. The laser scanning head itself was $300,000. Okay, what they found is that this sucks, <laughs> right? You cannot put this in your backpack. You cannot bring this on site. You, this only works under ideal laboratory conditions. This equipment is very sensitive. It requires a great deal of calibration. The work is very, very slow. Additionally, under ideal circumstances, you get it to work, you end up with data sets from the laser mapping that are so large, they're nearly impossible to synthesize into something useful. They spent 10 years after they spent scanning, they spent you know six months scanning, and 10 years trying to analyze the data from it. That's really not a solution, is it? It's a good step in the right direction, but it's not, it's not a good solution. You can now buy for, for $450, you can buy a small resolution laser scanner, but it still doesn't have the same impact as what Dr. Tolver has done. So let's go back. So how do we how do we do it? This is how. Okay. So now we know we um, Warren has told us about the process of the digital Michelangelo. So we know that um, people have previously spent countless um, or great amounts of money, um, time, effort on to making digital copies of physical objects, and now Corey Toller has discovered an inexpensive, quick and um, effective way of doing the same exact thing. So we'll show you how to do that. Can you hand me my props? <laughs> so, as you can see, she has a tripod, and what she will do is she'll take her prop, or whatever she wants to find the surface of. Oh, here. <laughs> pine cone. Pine cone. We don't know the function of a pine cone. Do you know the math to draw a pine cone? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know that math? I do. <laughs> yeah, no, I was gonna say draw it for us. You know what? I was in class. I'm like, why does Jordan have a pine cone? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what she does is she'll put the the pine cone in this example um, under the camera. Oh, and then she'll take a bunch of marbles. They have to be white and metallic marbles. <laughs> Thank you. And I can't remember what the white ones do, but the metallic ones will explain in a little bit. So what she does is she puts them around like this. There we go. And she will take, this is our flash. It's not really a flash. It's a. You see here a flash. This is a flash. <laughs> she takes an external flash. And what she will do, this is not really easy, but what she, she will do is she will start on one end of the, of the object. And she will take a series of pictures and flash at the same time while going over the object in a hemispheric pattern. And when she's doing that, um, well, basically, the, I think it's the, the um, camera that, is it the camera? It's the software 
No, no, no. So, so what she, what she does is that the the flash would be would it be a remote flash, so it would be synchronized. Yes, one. I have a question. Why is it one metallic and one white? We'll we'll get to that. Oh, okay. We're coming right to that. Yeah. So so this flash is synchronized. So the flash is going off at the same time that the picture snapped, and it's a hemispherical pattern because remember our conch shell. What was it that we were trying to get from that conch shell? Texture and shading. How do you get texture and shading? Different light. Shadows. Light. You've got to put light on it, right? Because we don't have a function. We can't just run it through an integral or run it through any kind of equation and know stuff about it, so we have to extrapolate. So as that light source passes, the light is on the pine cone, but we, we don't know exactly where that light's coming from. So that's the marbles. So the white marbles are going to tell us the brightness or the intensity of the light, which we can measure using something called Lambertian lightning laws, which we'll see in the next slide. Mm -hmm. And then the reflective marbles are going to tell us the angle. And what is that angle? If I'm holding, if I'm holding the light source right here, and the pine cones here or the marbles here, the light's going to travel perfectly straight. What am I? What am I getting? What am I creating? So basically, what's happening is we will take. This is going to be the flash. This is my flash, um, and it's going to. We're going to trail it over the object. Can you all see that? Yeah. Over the object in a hemispherical pattern, and the light. From this exact, from this point, is going to hit the pine cone at certain spots, and it's even it's going to hit the marbles also. It's going to hit everything in this in this section, and what she can do with her software is she can find the tangent to this point, and this point, and this point, and this point, and every single point on the pine cone, and with that she can actually find the normals. Well, the, the light are the normals. Oh. See, the light are the normals, and from the normals, we can get the tangent. Because if we had a function, we could calculate the tangent, right? But we don't have a function. How do you get a tangent for a physical object, for a point on a surface that you don't have a function of? Well, we do it exactly the opposite of what we study in calculus, right? So this is sort of like, you know, we did numerical integration when we couldn't integrate because we didn't have a function, or it was some one that we couldn't integrate. Well, this is, we're reverse engineering the whole process here. So the light creates our normal vector. Once we have our normal vector, we know that the normal vector is orthogonal to the tangent plane. From the normal vector, we can calculate the tangent plane. From the, calculate plane, from the tangent plane, we're golden. We can describe that however we want to describe it, using all of the tools that we've spent three semesters learning from Professor Dagon. <laughs> right? Right. So you see, so and so as you pass that over in a hemispherical pattern, you get you 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 build a metadata data set of all of the angles, those normal vectors that that light is coming in at, and from that you can extrapolate shading and you can extrapolate texture. And as you see, this is the image. This is using some Gaussian filtering, and this is using some RGB processing to, to work on the color. And then here is a texture map. And this texture map is from the metadata of this calculus. So what she's done is she's invented software that allows you to do this with an off-the-shelf camera that you can buy at Best Buy and a $150 flash and some children's toys. And that's pretty amazing, and it has much better results. And it's real time, too. With her software, she can take six of these images, ten of these images, and in three seconds or less, spit out results. And that's really amazing. That's not like the digital Michelangelo, is it? So, so, how, do, so how do we do it? So we have, we found a couple different, from one of her reports, we found a, di a bunch of different um, mathematical equations. We don't really understand all of them because we're not, we're not her. But, um, <laughs> so we have the Lambertian lighting law, and I think what she said was E is, is the um, yielding intensities, and A is the surface point, which also is our constant in this equation. And it also, yeah, it, I think it's the co constant, right? It's probably. I think so. Um, and then I think, I'm not sure, I think it's either a dot or a cross product between N, the normals and the um, and L. And she said that L is the um, directions of the light sources. So what she's doing is she's, she, later she can make a matrix of the normals and the light source and a constant and get the um, yielding intensities. So that Lambertian lighting law is not stuff that she developed. She's standing on the shoulders of predecessors and giants. And that's what allows her to extrapolate the exact angle of the light. And the white marbles allow her to calculate the brightness and the intensity of the light, which is a value you need to work with the Lambertian lighting laws, right? You need to know the apparent, this is what I'm told. <laughs> so. And the black marbles? 
Oh. But they're reflective. They're, they're mirrored marbles. Yeah. So from the white ones, you get the brightness and the intensity of the light. And from the mirror, you get the angle from the reflection. Hmm. Yeah, I think the, the reflective marbles, they actually stand. There's a, there is a um, source. I mean, there is, um, they're a, what do you call it, reference point for the light, yes. for the light source. Yes. OK. So we so have Gaussian we have, filtering. Yeah, we have Gaussian filtering. And I think this equation is just the standard. And this one is where she added in normals. So she's manipulating this equation right. for what she needs. You can go into Photoshop right now. When you use your phone and you take a picture on your phone, it does Gaussian filtering. When you smooth and you blur and you do, Gaussian filtering is an underlying mechanic of most normal image processing. But what she's done, see I put a pun in there, normal. She's thrown in normals mm -hmm. into the normal image processing. And see here we've added the absolute value of n sub i minus the absolute value of n sub j, right? And what do the i and j stand for? I don't know. She wouldn't tell me because some of this is unpublished, and she's very protective of it. <laughs> but it's super cool stuff. Okay, so we also we found an equation for curvature estimation. And we know curvature, right? We know how to use K and curvature. Mm -hmm. And we have we found first and second fundamental tensors. What's a tensor? This was a learning experience for us. We were very excited about this. Anybody know what a tensor is? Um. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't have a a texting thing for you guys, but how do you do it? Okay, so we turn to our best friend Wikipedia because they have some really awesome information for us. So a tensor are geometric objects that describe linear relations between vectors, scalars, and other tensors. Elementary examples are such relations that include the dot product. We know the dot product, right? The cross product and linear products. So this entire time we've been working with tensors and had no idea what a tensor was. Yeah, and this, this picture right here is basically the vine cone in our, in our um, example. The, the block, that's what's happening in the software. That's what she's finding, those normals. OK, and then we, we also have, um, she called it vectors in a local tangent plane. And I'm not sure if this is right, Dagan, you might, have, might have to correct me. But I think this is what we were doing in section 15.9, changing the variables to make the integration process more easy or easier. 15.9. 15.9. So yeah, I think that's what she's doing here, and then she can get those two extra, those two equations from that. And then she's dif so she's differentiating in these two equations, and it looks like the chain rule down the um, fundamental tensors. I think del n del u dot u del n del v dot u del n del u dot v del n dot v dot v. It's like a Jacobian, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a Jacobian. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> Pretty relevant to what we're studying right now, yeah. right? I was, I was really amazed when I, when I had the, the, I was really, really fortunate to be able to, to hear her lecture and to see her lecture. And her slide and presentation had a lot of pictures that she wouldn't give to me. But, <laughs> so it was, it was a lot more awesome than what we're doing. But she would walk through this. And I was really pleased with how much of the math that I could follow. And I was, I was really, now, I couldn't reproduce it. But when she walked through it, I could understand it a little bit. And so therefore, you know, del n del u of i j is 1 half n sub 1 plus 1 minus j. And so this is a vector. This is the vector equation, right? Yeah. Multiscale curvature shading. I think these are from, are these from the white marbles? Yes. Yeah. And we have, we have um, phi. Is that phi in there? And we have r equals um, square root of x, and x squared y squared. She loses me a little bit on this. I don't lose yeah. me a lot on that. So that's some of the math. That's about as much as I can explain. Yeah. There's also, uh, understand that the, the most critical and the most impressive part of this from a mathematics perspective is hers. She hasn't released it yet. She's non-published. She, it is, hasn't been published. So she's not showing the full extent of the math processing that she's come up with. So it's, um, she's really right now the only person on the planet that knows it. It's in her brain and on her laptop, and that's it. And nobody's going to get to see it until she gets a faculty position and she gets published. <laughs> so that's just how the world works. <laughs> so here, here's a really good example. So we've talked a lot about how we do it, but here's the result. Here's the original image, just one single photograph. And so she took this, and she took a series of photos, passed a light source over it in a hemispherical pattern, and just compared the texture and shading differences. So imagine if you're a researcher, and you need to study this, and all you have is a digital copy. This is going to rot. This is not going to be here 300 years from now. But a, this picture will. 
300 years from now, when this species of pine tree does not exist anymore, researchers are going to be able to come back to it, thanks to Dr. Corey Toller's work, and be able to have this level of detail about the morphology and the structure of this item. It's, it's, you can almost touch it. Here's our Swiss chard. Here's the original leaf. Now, if you're, if you're a botanist and you study like the vascular structure of leaves, just see how much more of the vascular structure that you can see. You can see every wrinkle in this leaf as compared to original source image. Now, we cheated a little bit. Um, this leaf is not exactly this leaf, but this is a Swiss chard leaf. <laughs> if you look closely, somebody's going to notice that, right? Look at this. This is actually a miniature terracotta soldier. Look at, can you even read the characters? But look here. So the other thing that I didn't mention about her process, because this texture and the shading is extrapolated from a metadata set about the image, it's infinitely zoomable. So if you take the 22 megapixel camera, camera and take an image, so the zoom is limited only by the quality of the camera. So you, we could zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom. And because we have the vector calculus behind it, the texturization and the shading is infinitely zoomable. So this is a miniature, and so that's pretty cool. Look at the, de the detail around the, the belt. Now, she did what we could not do with laser scanning and over a million dollars worth of equipment in laser scanning. She did with you know $3,000 worth of off-the-shelf Best Buy hardware. Look, the impressive part about this is look at the butt. Can you see the petals of the butt? Yeah. You can't see that. You cannot, this, there's more information that's present. Here's our pine cone again. Look at texturization and shading map on top of the regular image of the vine cone. She's really pushing the envelope here. Cave painting. You can't even see the animals. This is the original cave painting. Look what she's able to do. Now, the, the presentation that I saw, she had a whole series of these where she had done these on hieroglyphics from Egyptian pyramids. And you could see whole sections of the hieroglyphics that you can't perceive with the, with the naked eye. People would spend previously their entire career with a magnifying glass and a really strong light trying to look at it and piece it together. But now we can just do some shading. We can, we can predict where that shading would fall. And we can produce a texture map. And we can see things from cave paintings and hieroglyphics that we couldn't see before. Look at this, you can see every dent in this zucchini. Yeah. You can see every line, every mark in the cutting board. That radicchio looks kind of gross after it's been shaded, but it looks pretty tasty <laughs> before, it doesn't it? That's my second favorite. <laughs> I love this one. That's pretty neat. Look at this one. These are tools, like what you get from Home Depot. Look after they've been texturized and after they've been shaded. Look at this close up. You can actually see the maker's mark, where the maker's mark has been struck into that pair of tin snips. Can you read it? Mm -hmm. It's like 56. Over A2, rigid. This is pretty amazing stuff to me. 